But this conference itself is, is good for your mental health because families need fathers, it's a friendly presence in your life. Uh, great people like Vincent, they create hope, direction, purpose. All these things I've listed there are things we need for our mental health. Mental health isn't an illness. Mental health is a positive state that will drop away if the needs aren't met. So I always treat mental health problems not as what illness have you got, but what of your needs as a human being have not been met. When you do that as a psychologist, you succeed. Whether you're working with women, men, or you know, it doesn't matter. But obviously for men, there are different patterns that you need to connect with, and that's what I've been trying to do for the last 10 years with John, setting things up in the British Psychological Society. But uh, all of these things, validation, identification, information, advice, solutions, network, access to expertise, these are vital. So all the, the legal people here are key, because when the family court system is, 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 is a nightmare, you need legal expertise more than anything. And of course, those people are also relating to you. They're your friends. They're making psychological difference. As I often say to psychiatrists, it's not your drugs that are treating people, it's the relationship you have with them. A good psychiatrist is, your, is helping you as a person, not just giving you drugs. Uh, so it should be obvious, but what are the things that losing access to kids attack your human mental health? What can we do to take, help the dark places be a bit less dark? Now these are the first, these are the five universal psychological needs of the human condition. I was asked by the Health Secretary in 2006, 2007 to define these for her, but then she disappeared. So these <laughs> of everything with policy comes and goes depending on politicians, who's there, who's around, whether you can, but I did get an advisory group together with some very eminent people and I, we listed these as the five greatest <coughs> psychological needs of the human condition. Obviously, the big one is love, not just to be loved, we all need to be loved, but we need to have someone to receive our love. And obviously with children, that's the, the, you know, partners and children are the big relationships in our lives. Pretty obvious. Uh, but to be heard is a big one as well. So a big need we all have as human beings, if we're not being heard, our mental health's gonna go down. If there's no love in our lives, our mental health's gonna go down. If we're not heard, our mental health is going to go down. The next one is belonging. If we don't belong to something, uh, our mental health is going to go down. So you can see what, where we're going to here. The more we can uh, meet those needs, the more we're going to keep our mental health from going down. But to, be, to achieve, to make a difference, is important for mental health. If you're not having an impact on anything around you, your mental health is going to go right down. Uh, and to have meaning, some purpose, some direction. These are obvious things, really, and every artist who ever wrote a book or painted a picture or made a song is telling you this stuff every day, but as scientists, we don't often <laughs> uh, factor analyze it. The other five needs of the human condition, I'll just let you read those, are, I'm not gonna focus on so much, but they're there as well. We need, obviously, worship something. Even if you're not religious, you need to worship something. Uh, connection. Procreation, creation, laughter, and crying and mourning. These are all the big needs of the human condition. Obviously, mourning and grief come into how you cope with loss of access. Because obviously, if you've lost access to, some, to a child who's still there, you can't grieve. You know, these are very important things. So I'm going to focus on those first five. So let's come to, if you're a dad, and obviously there are mums in the situation too. I'm not, you know... I'm not into, as Vincent saying, this gender warfare. We should be into everyone working together for the sake of children. But if you're cut off from a child, all of those needs I just listed are violated. You're severing a love bond, part of the self. Also, there will be feelings around the loss of the relationship with the, the partner as well. Even if that's gone into a malevolent situation, there's still feelings of loss. And, uh, so basically, not being valued by society as a father as well. This is another thing people have been talking about, that we value dads, we don't enough. And yet all the evidence shows that being cut off from a dad if you're a child, man, boys and girls, is bad for, massively bad for your mental health. So as a society, we need to value fathering and mothering, because sometimes we value people, adults mainly as taxpayers rather than as parents. Uh, so then being unheard, 
Because if you're in this family court system or, or, uh, and you're not being heard, you're feeling invisible. So that need isn't being met. Then you're not feeling uh, part of a family or, or you're being excluded and alienated. You're not able to make an impact and able to achieve. You have a lot sense of loss of identity as a dad and as a, you know, all of the, your men, all the things that are bad for your mental health are happening to you if you're in that situation. And it's beyond ordinary tra trauma and grief. Uh, because a trauma is something that you can sort of get over and carry on, sort of recover from a bit. But if something's ongoing, it's very hard to recover from it. Same way grief, how do you recover from a, from a loss that's still happening and, and the person that is missing is still around? Uh, so being alienated from a child will produce a lot of trauma and grief feelings. And you look at any textbook, trauma and grief, it's the big, big one in mental health. These are the big, you know, aspects of mental health. And depression and things like that follow from all of these things, just not being able to overcome a trauma or a grief because you can't control the outcome. Uh, so protracted, what, if you're alienated from a child, you, you've got what we're, I'm going to, I'm working on a concept with a, a colleague called Zach Fine, which is called, uh, protracted ruptured attachment. In other words, you're attached to someone, but you can't be with them. And that's very destructive. Obviously, you know that better than I do. Uh, but now we're going to add to this mix. We just had the universal needs of the human condition, <coughs> psychologically, which the government years ago did accept, but obviously we couldn't put that into policy at the time. Uh, we now have what John and I have been working on, the male archetype. Uh, John and I have been working on trying to define what are the core universal instincts for men which differ on average for women. Obviously women and men overlap a lot but there are average differences and these are the big ones for men. You've got to be a fighter and a winner. This is a drive for men. I'm going to fight and win. I'm going to be a provider and a protector. Uh, I'm going to retain mastery and control. These are the big ones uh, for men. If you don't feel you're fighting and winning, you're a loser. And a lot of people who get suicidal, they ultimately feel I'm a loser. Uh, that's a thing that men feel more shame about, feeling they're losing. Uh, and if you can't provide and protect for your family, you feel shame. So again, underneath all of this is masculine shame, uh, which does correlate to suicide. Uh, and then a loss of control. So all of these are the male archetypes. There are female archetypes too, we haven't time to go into them, but, and of course not all men are the same, not all women, you know, but, and obviously, but these archetypes, we're now, as John was saying, attitudes to masculinity make these things negative, you know, you shouldn't be so aggressive or competitive, but except when women are now, young girls are being brought up to follow the male archetype more, and it's, and it's positive, it's being regarded as a positive thing for girls, but for boys it's, we're, we're wary now of competitive men, you know, even though it's the archetype. So, as a society, our attitudes are, are, you know, are a bit conflicted. So we've got a perfect storm of stress. You're doing a multiple whammy of, of uh, stress, pain and injustice, really, we're talking about, and everyone's been talking about it already. But the first and foremost thing psychologically to do then is to normalise that these feelings you're going through, it doesn't make you crazy. You're just a human being in a really adverse set of circumstances. So if someone wants to come along and offer you therapy, if you're alienated, it's not therapy because there's something crazy about you. It's therapy because you're in a situation where you've gone below a threshold, as John pointed out. You've gone, your dot on that graph has gone down. Because if someone took my children, my house, my living, my identity away from me, I, my mental health would go down. I, I, you know, it's just a normal human thing. Mental health is normal. Even the most people who seem crazy are hearing voices, are hearing voices that relate to things that have gone wrong in their life. And usually people who are deluded in mental health system, they think they're, they always think there's someone important, <coughs> like God or the devil. Well, why? Because God and the devil are important. So people have delusions of being important because as children they've been neglected and aren't important. So mental health is normal. 
it's not about craziness, it's about despair, damage, trauma. Uh, so we've got to normalise those feelings. That, and then, of course, you've got to do something about them. Now, as John was saying, men, on average, prefer more practical solutions than just talking about feelings. Talking about feelings is fantastic, but I've worked with women as well who don't particularly want to do that. It's, and, of course, if, you, if you're homeless, you don't want to sit and talk about your feelings about why you're homeless. You want a home. You know, so, but it's not about, I'm not saying talking about feelings is bad, but it's, we've got to focus on all the practical things that are making your mental health drop. So, uh, basically you're feeling overwhelmed and, and, and you feel you're going crazy, so that doesn't help either. Then, of course, if you're in this situation, you can act out, you can say things which sound a bit aggressive. And then, of course, the system will use that against you. And I've seen this with women as well. Women have had their children taken from them uh, and then they get angry and then their anger is used to say, well, look, you're angry, you're not fit to have your child back. I mean, it's a crazy cycle. Uh, so I've worked with women and men, you know, who've lost access to kids and it's the same old stuff. But obviously we're biased much more ab about men for the reasons we've all been talking about. So obviously everyone's in a different position, but the key thing obviously you need is, is an attachment to someone who believes in you, who, who can support you and help you. And often that might, that might be a lawyer. I'm sure the legal work being done is, uh, you know, the pro bono legal work is so valuable because in this situation you need someone who can get you through that, navigate that system. There is a, a, an approach out there and, and uh, Billy McGranigan's going to talk later about his approach, which I think is even more personal than this one. But I was just coming up with an example of a colleague of mine who's doing some work, and there's a website there you can, or you can look up for this one. And, and obviously, uh, it's very uh, similar stuff. But the, the important thing uh, to, to notice uh, with, with an approach like this is, is that... Uh, you're combining group therapy sessions with individual sessions. That's one thing my colleague Zach Fine down in Cornwall does. And this is all online, so you don't have to live in Cornwall. He helps individuals to distinguish these different forces. Now, he's talking about outside forces. Now, these are very important because most of the forces you're dealing with are outside forces. So gamma bias was mentioned by John earlier. That's basically our theory uh, that in this society we live in, all the bad things about masculinity are magnified in the press and in policy. All the good things about masculinity are never publicised. If a man rescues somebody, people don't say, isn't masculinity a great thing because all these guys are going around you know, rescuing everybody? Uh, if men go and die in wars, as they're doing now in Ukraine, sadly, to protect. And obviously there are some women soldiers who, you know, who meet the same standard, but basically on, a on average there's more men going out there to lay their lives down for their fellow citizens in Ukraine. But we don't say, isn't masculinity great? You know, aren't men brave? Aren't they good? We, oh, but as soon as a man does something bad, and the men who do do something bad are the vast minority, a real minority of men, we generalise to the whole idea that there's something wrong with masculinity. So we've got a whole culture of beliefs, which is what John and I are calling gamma bias, uh, which really means that if a, if a woman achieves something, it's celebrated more. If females achieve, it's celebrated these days. We're empowering girls. If a boy does something, uh, we don't celebrate it. If a boy does something bad, we do judge it. And if a boy does something, uh, if a girl does something bad, we play it down a bit. You can see all these attitudes playing out with these, you know, this court case as well that's going on at the moment between uh, Johnny Depp. You can see these kind of attitudes are suddenly society is having to look at its own biases. Uh, but there's so, there's so many uh, outside forces. People fatherless in our society, we don't think children need dads as much as they need mums. And that's, there may even be some evolutionary basis to that. But they need, they need both parents. But because we're... Uh, we are... Disposable. Sorry? Disposable. Yes. Absolutely. The men are disposable in the way if, you know, there are arguments about uh, female disposability, but yeah, men are disposable in wars. Everything's been built. 
everything we're doing, every building we're in has been built by working class guys who probably, some of whom died building it. I mean, men have built the infrastructure of our world and many of them die. Working class guys get a very bad press. So there's a class issue in there as well. But yeah, men are seen as disposable. They're not seen as so, such important need to children, even though all the evidence, you read Warren Farrell's latest book, John's book, if you don't have a dad, boy or girl, your mental health is going to be more at risk in terms of behaviours, in terms of your life course. So fatherhood is very important, but we don't value it. And men, even in suicide research, if you look at all the suicide research literature, the word masculinity of men never appears. All the books on suicide, even though 70%, 75% suicides all around the world are men, suicide research hasn't focused on male issues at all. So the bias against men is, is evident even in the suicide research. And that's why John and I are challenging the British Psychological Society to be more male focused in its research, more balanced. We're not looking to, it's not a gender war, we just want inclusivity. So all of these things are, are outside forces pressing down upon you. Then there are inside forces, because obviously you do get angry, you're gonna get depressed. You might have not had a happy childhood. So if you've now lost your, your ch access to your child and you had a troubled childhood, it magnifies your reaction. So everyone's, everything's gonna interact. So we, we really do need to uh, recognise that there are normal feelings, but equally they will interact with your past experiences. And, and Zach uses a polyvagal theory, which just means you can get into three mental states. You can either be calm, which we all need to be to do anything effective in life. If you're about to score a penalty in a football match and you don't keep calm, you'll miss it. You see that with footballers all the time. Uh, you can get into fight and flight, as John said, where you're in a kind of looking for danger all the time, which is not a good state either. But the worst state is to be completely collapsed and overwhelmed. And what obviously Zach's approach to uh, helping dads is to help them stay, to get into that calm space. Whenever you communicate with a court or someone, always show the calm side of yourself. Never never do, but it's very difficult not to over, overreact when you're in these difficult situations. And that's what lawyers are very good at coaching people to present something that's gonna look good because it's how you're judged. Not your in, people can't have a window into your soul, sadly. They don't realize you're a good person. They're just judging you on, on what you look like on the outside. Uh, so, we, 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 you can look at that in different ways. I mean, you can look at it as parent, adult, child. You can communicate like a child, saying, I want to see my kid, you know, what are you doing to me? You can communicate from a parental position, saying, you shouldn't do this, you know. But the only way to really communicate effectively is as an adult, adult to adult, reason, evidence. So how do you get into the green zone and feel a little bit calmer? Obviously, these are just platitudes. I don't want to patronise people. But obviously, if you can get grounded in nature, just go for a walk. I mean, when I find I'm in a bad state, and I've, I really sometimes just walking and just connecting with nature sometimes brings you back. Uh, obviously, if you have a religious faith, that can help, but a lot of people don't. Physical activity can be useful. Uh, Meditative zones, just getting in, just trying to switch off, trying to switch out. But if your mind is overwhelmed by stuff, it's very hard to do. Anything that connects your mind, a film, a song, music, anything that can take you into a place where you're in a more healthy thing. But the key thing you need is supportive relationships. No one can do this stuff on their own. Uh, you know, you need some kind of team around you. And I think that to try and use the male archetype positively, I would say, don't think of seeking help as a weakness. Think of seeking help as getting a team. I'm getting, I'm getting organised. You know, I'm taking action. Use the male archetype positively. I'm going to win, but I'm going to win in a different way. I'm going to win strategically. I'm going to win... Uh, also, you can win by... If you get a period without seeing your child, you can win by thinking... If I maintain my dignity now and do my best, when I have a relationship with my child later in life, we look back on what happened. The fact that I was a great survivor of this stuff will make me such a role model to my kids in the future. They will, 
they will really appreciate. They will learn the story as they get older. Kids will learn and look back. They won't all be brainwashed into thinking you're a bad person. And if you can hang on through this difficult time, and then your children will look back on it with you when they're old enough to, have to seek you out, or even if you don't ever win that legal battle, then you can look back and then your child will be, see you as a role model, who, as a survivor, as a strong person. So it doesn't all have, even defeat in the legal system, it doesn't have to make you a loser. It can make you a winner for the future, but you have to hang on for a future relationship. Obviously writing, expressing, create anything. I mean, we've, we've got colleagues who've done evidence that shows that Writing can help guys, putting things down, not always talking, but just writing it. I had a soldier who was a client who, who was in Iraq, and he had all sorts of trauma memories. He'd also been uh, domestically abused, and he was always arrested. When the police came, they assumed he was the man, he was the guilty party. He wrote these wonderful poems, and we just went through his poems. Every psychology session, I just went through his poems. And by the end of it, he was not suicidal, he was not drunk, he was not an alcoholic anymore. He got his life together. But I wasn't doing some magical therapy. I was just helping connect with him as a person through his poetry and believing him, listening to him. So obviously, if you're in a legal battle or whatever, if there's some way you can have breaks and not devote every day, 24 hours, to this fight, but just give yourself a day when you're not doing it, sounds easy. And, and you know, I don't, again, it's easy for psychologists to sound patronizing. <laughs> with all these tips, you know. Uh, but obviously therapy, as John said, can help. It's not like you're crazy, but you've been pushed into a danger zone by social pressures. So now you need the sort of therapy someone else might have if they didn't have those pressures, but they had some other reasons to need therapy. It's not, not dishonourable. So we're using the male archetype positively. Think. Fight constructively for your child, not against an enemy. Think of victory as winning time with your child, either now or in the future. Uh, take a pride in masculine honour, self-control, dignity and strength and adversity. Don't be painted as a villain, a madman or a loser. Be a hero and a survivor. Again, these can sound a bit tacky, but they can be very true. <laughs> Think of the pride your children could have in you when they're old enough to understand what you've been through and, and gone for their sake. Hang, hold yourself together for them. Think of seeking help, not as a weakness, but as getting an army together. A good army, because there are good armies and bad armies. Remember, you are sadly not alone. The fact we're having this conference, you know, you guys here know more about this than me, that this is not infrequent. Because of these attitudes, these issues... So if you're not alone, then we need a network of brothers and, of course, sisters, because a lot of women are getting this stuff now. Uh, and just to add, I know of not much time left probably, but I have had, I can't go into detail, but I have had one or two conversations with people in government uh, in the back, sort of, not in the front shop window, but we're, they're beginning to be recognised men's issues more in government. Uh, and people are looking, you know, the health department is now looking for suicide prevention measures. And once you realise that a big part of suicide prevention is men, and a big part of men's issues is access to children, policies around, you know, the top-down stuff's got to happen as well. It's not just about hanging on in there. But it, yeah. Okay, and I, yeah, we, I'm going to stop in a minute because probably you want to ask stuff or correct me on certain things because, again, you know, uh, the key thing here is that we are, one or two of us are talking privately to government people about men's issues. I'm only saying that to say there is some receptivity. People are not totally accepting that gender equality means women's issues, which sadly, when you've got inequalities, a committee that's called uh, Women and Equalities. It rather tags the idea of equalities onto just women, which is a bit sad. But that's just the nature of the society we're in in the West. And we have to fight that, but with evidence. You know, and there are people, civil servants and others, ministers, who are open 
to this stuff. But I don't know where it will go anywhere because, as I said, the original guy, uh, five needs I put to the health secretary 15 years ago, they did influence something, but often when you try to do stuff with politicians, it doesn't always go somewhere. But equally, if there's a culture of receptivity, there's going to be an all-parliamentary group that John's speaking at where uh, this evidence is increasingly going to parliamentarians now, MPs. People are coming together cross-party, beginning to think. So I think the work we've all been doing is making an impact, but it's just, just a very, very slow. But it is, it is moving in the right direction. So I'd wanted to leave with some hope on that. I'm going to stop there and then just hope that, you know, we can have a meaningful few minutes just discussing the issues. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hello, Jonathan. Um, sorry, my name's Jonathan. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, sorry, quick pre-question. I'm sorry if you've told us already, but are these slides going to be available online? Yes. After, right, okay. Yeah, the photographing. Can, oh, everything there can be online, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the question is, you, you mentioned about what to do if somebody offers you counselling for alienation. Well, I don't know if it's different in England, but where I'm in, in Wales, the problem is they don't. Right. And when you go from 50-50 for nine years to zero, not even letterbox contact, yeah. overnight, yeah. the only way to get that kind of grief counselling is to go to the doctor, be referred as a nutter. I know, to be quite frank. No, How no. do we say, look, if you're going to spend a third of a million pounds breaking a family up in you know, government legal costs, surely part of that process should be provide the father with the, or the mother with the grief counselling that they're going to need after that, but they don't. How do we fix that? You know, how do we say, look, if you're going to do that, you've got to do that as well? Well, I agree, we need to fix that, and that's at that level of, of those that make policy and provide the resources. But I, again, what we've all been saying, we need to provide the evidence to those people so they change those policies. But as you say, it's not even grief, because if you're... It's not even simple grief, because if you've lost a child and they're still there, so it's almost like someone whose child has been murdered, but they don't know where the body is. It's kind of that horrible feeling of, I'm lost, I, I don't know where my child, you know, because sometimes parent, children can be taken away, can't they? You don't even know where they are. No, so, closure, closure. Closure, that's exactly. Grief without closure is a horrible thing, yeah. Yeah, hi there. My name's Matt. Um, yeah, you, you seemed at the beginning of your uh, presentation to make a link between uh, mental health and the work of uh, your legal team, for instance. But I, I, don't, I don't see a, a link there at all um, in okay. terms of the, and maybe this is a, a more of a question for, um, for, for you, but um, I, I don't see that the lawyers have an empathy for someone's mental, uh, you know, your mental health when you go to them. Um, so I'm just wondering whether there's more that can be done within the legal process oh, of yeah. understanding yeah. someone's mental health because you need to be yeah. very strong mentally yeah. to go through the family court system. That's a good point because what you're saying really is though that I'm making the point that a good lawyer is like gold dust in terms of getting you the outcome you need. But yeah, it's not, the lead, it's not the first thing a lawyer is trained in as empathy for suffering guys who can't see their children. It's not kind of, you're not selected as a lawyer based around, I mean, sadly, not even in mental health professions does that always happen either. But uh, so obviously if you get a lawyer who's empathic, that's brilliant. I mean, if they're just winning the case for you, I mean, I, when I've had problems with my first marriage, I had the lawyer was the one who could shoot the enemy down. I mean, I have got a friend who's a QC. He says, we're our hired gun, really. You know, we shoot down. Because the legal system's adversarial, you've just got to have a better gun than the... You know, it becomes like that. But the point I'm making, I suppose, is that in psychological terms, what mental health is derived on attachments to... You have good and bad attachments in life. If a lawyer is a good attachment in your life when you're in a legal situation, that improves your mental health simply through the relationship being there. Uh, so, unless your lawyer is actually working against you and doesn't believe you, which I suppose can happen, uh, nonetheless, a lawyer is... A, all I'm trying to say to lawyers is, as well, you are psychologically important to people, uh, and maybe we could do some more joint work in training lawyers. I've been sort of... Uh, 
you know, I'm thinking about how we try, because also lawyers witness some pretty grim stuff as, you know, they hear some awful stories. Sorry, next question. Sorry, but I had to move Thank on. Thank you. Uh, my name's Manish. Um, one of the things that we have is the need to protect. And the thing that I found hardest is seeing your child suffer from the separation and alienation yeah, yeah. and feeling very helpless and because Absolutely. you're guilty until proven innocent, protected timelines. And I wonder if there is a, a, an opportunity for fa uh, branches to engage with the clinical commissioning groups and have them attend branch meetings so they understand the trauma that the parents are going through and then they, they can take a public health interest in what's going on with their local population and that really get an understanding of what's happening and the risk that the children are at. I don't see anybody looking after the children's welfare, their emotional and mental harm that they're suffering because of alienation. You're so, absolutely right. You've made a great point there and that answers itself. That's a brilliant suggestion and I can only say thanks for making it. Yeah, we've got to finish now, so thank you very much.